Everybody is equal at the WTO, but some are more equal than others, and the Americans are obviously more equal than the Africans. Americans have something to offer, so what they say counts. Africans have very little to offer, so their voice is less important when it comes to bargaining. And the WTO is all about bargaining on different interests. The Africans were perfectly aware that as far as cotton is concerned, they were being dealt with unfairly by the WTO or by WTO rules. But they didn't really believe that countries of relatively little importance could have influence at the WTO. And I think that when President Blaise Compaoré came to Geneva and delegations agreed that the situation was unacceptable, they realized that in fact it was possible for them to defend their interests inside the WTO. As support for the Africans grows, the Americans, very self-confident, refuse to discuss the subject. Well, there are two reactions. One is um, a, a concern because free trade is beneficial to all, uh, developing countries as well as developed countries. On the other hand, there was um, relief that the agenda pushed by the West African countries, among others, uh, did not go anywhere. A lot of problems in, in, in the West African countries are of their own making. There is clearly some arrogance in the American stance, but in their defense, it's true that until then, the African governments haven't seemed too concerned about agriculture. Generally speaking, African leaders' priorities were based on satisfying the needs of the cities for very simple reasons. People say that people from the cities are more troublesome, and if there's violence, it's likely to come from the cities, not rural areas. Thirty-five-year-old Bani Kapanran is a cotton producer in the town of Buenru, in Benin. He owns nine acres of land and six oxen. Today, the price of cotton means he doesn't earn enough to get by. And if the situation continues, he'll become one more of the many farmers living below the poverty line, on less than one dollar a day. We've had some very difficult times. Things have been tough since last year, really tough. Usually we never know the price of cotton before starting production. So when the harvest is over, we invite the people in charge. They meet in Cotonou maybe with the ginners to discuss the price. And finally they tell us that prices have gone down and the world market, we don't understand a thing. And all that is making it difficult for us to produce cotton. Bani Kapanran is the secretary of his local farmers' association. Working in the cotton fields is tough enough, but relations with the authorities aren't easy either. This year, a government delegation came. They even brought people from the World Bank. Because we keep saying that we're being paid late, so far we haven't been paid. We've sold them the cotton, the discounts are blocked, we don't understand a thing. We ask them and they say it's coming, it's coming. They're always lying to us. They know we don't understand anything and nobody will stand up to them. So they come, make a mess and leave, you see? 
Okay. Producers sell their cotton to ginning plants. They remove the grains from the cotton fiber and compact the cotton to make bales ready for export. The state of Benin acts as an intermediary between producers and the plants to make sure that the farmers are paid by the ginners. We have no access to bank loans. When we send our bills to the ginners, they have one week to pay. And when they pay us, we pay the producers. So, if the ginners pay late, the whole process is delayed. And this year, one of the two companies started paying cash, but it's already run out. Since the beginning of January, on the pretext that they've used up their checkbooks and that they have to order new ones from France, they've stopped paying. Apparently, privatizations imposed by the International Monetary Fund in the name of liberalizing the economy have not brought the expected progress. It's true that at the time I used to say less state means a better state. It was a slogan. As a result, we acted as if the producers and the private sector had qualities that they just didn't have. And since the private sector and producers weren't assuming the responsibilities we had transferred to them, and the state no longer had the right to assume them, it was complete chaos. Instead of liberalism, we had a kind of economic debauchery. I grew up with the arrival of democracy, but I think we've given up on our old dreams. We've given up on what we thought were the virtues of liberalism as opposed to the Stalinism that we knew before. And I think we need a readjustment, and that readjustment is all the more important because we know there's no other way. We can't go on thinking the state must disappear and at the same time say the state must regulate. Liberalization and privatization, words that sound strange to Bani Kapanran, especially when he's asked if he's ever heard about subsidies. No, pas du tout. No, not at all, not at all. They're for developed countries, right? Well, we always get a tough deal here, we always get a tough deal. If cotton prices went up again, it would clearly provide a breathing space for African producers. But it wouldn't solve all their problems.